Hi, everybody. Welcome to Talking Sunday Readings. My name is Ann Carter, coming to you virtually from somewhere. Um, we are, um, again, talking about the, uh, the uh, lessons, the lectionary readings for the second Sunday of Easter already. Um, I am here, as usual, with Pastor Richard Stadler. I'm sure he'll oh. give a shout and a wave. And oh, Father Chuck Carter, also a uh, wave. Um, we are, today we are discussing the readings, which are the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, verse 14a, and then verses 22 to 32. Uh, the epistle is 1 Peter 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 3 to 9, and then the gospel is John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Uh, I get to just give a little overview of the Acts 2 a reading from Acts. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man, handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you, confidently, of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Ooh, our reading. Uh, it's one of those that get that um, the lectionary cuts into pieces, so it starts out and identifies that Peter is the one who is giving a sermon, and then we get to hear part of what he preaches, and he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And Pentecost is 50 days after Easter, so it's after the resurrection. And for 40 of those days, Jesus has been here. He has been uh, talking, teaching his disciples, yet they've been hanging out, they've been fishing, they've been having dinners, they have been talking things over. And I would imagine that Jesus did for the disciples, Peter and the 12 and all of the rest of them, the same thing that he did with the Emmaus disciples. And that is, as it says in Luke 24, um, he says, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them all in the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Um, because I was puzzled as to where did Peter come up with this when he's, when he's bringing back the the idea in this lesson of what David knew and how David could extrapolate out that he was talking about Jesus. Well, Peter knew because Jesus explained it to him that in all of the scriptures, they were all talking about him and about what the father was going to do through the son and what the Holy Spirit was going to um, reveal to us. Um, because how did David know that, 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 um, uh, I don't know, where is it? Um, that, he, that his Holy One would not experience corruption. So how did David know that if it wasn't about him? Because Peter says, David is dead, 
His bones are here. We know where his grave is here in Jerusalem. David wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about someone else. Um, and he was talking about the Messiah, who was one of his descendants, who is this Jesus, it says in verse 32. God raised up this Jesus. And again, the what we talked about last week for Easter, we are all witnesses. Um, it is the witnesses to Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. Those witnesses go out now and start, start this whole process, what we know now of changing the world uh, as far as how people live, how people understand living, um, how people understand what happens when we die. We change because of, of what the witnesses have told us and the Holy Spirit helps bring, bring us to faith. One last thing that I noticed in verse 23, it was a definite plan of God. This wasn't an accident. This wasn't just some happenstance. All through the Old Testament, this was planned and God brought it to fruition in the life of Jesus Christ. It's, it's really, really cool once you can get underneath some of the layers of it. Um, and it's what we confess. We confess um, in the Nicene Creed. He rose on the third day according to the scriptures. The scriptures tell us. Jesus explained it. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. They, they all tell the same story, and that is of what a great God we have. So I turn it over to you guys. Okay, Chuck. That, that promise there in Acts, uh, picking up from Psalm, you know, not, you'll not let your Holy One see corruption. You know, that's, um, I think, a real powerful uh, in a statement about uh, Jesus and his death and in his, his resurrection. Um, and it's, um, it, it's a promise that applies to us as well in so far as uh, we share uh, in, a, in a death like Christ's that we share also in a resurrection like Christ's. Um, and so it's something that, that Jesus uh, says of us as well um, as, as Christians. Um, a reading from First Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you loved him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. If we move uh, to First Peter, um, we have kind of picking up similarly on this theme uh, about the power of God um, and about the work that Jesus has done and how that work uh, kind of propels us, strengthens us, um, and, and gives us what we need to live this life of faith. Um, he starts in verse 3 of the first chapter of, of the first letter of Peter, um, that b proclaiming first, blessed be God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? By his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Um, this is kind of picking up again last week, what we were talking about with the nature of resurrection, of resurrection faith, um, that it, this is a living hope. It's not a, 
a false hope or a dead hope. It's, it's a real tangible living hope, something that's present with us uh, each day. Um, born anew to a, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead um, and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Sort of like you won't let your Holy One see corruption. You know, what we have in store is something that is uh, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, um, who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, Peter here is writing to uh, an audience that uh, is obviously experiencing some uh, adversity. Um, as he says that uh, though now for a little while, you may have to suffer various trials. And of course, as a nation, these last few weeks, we have been uh, suffering various trials of our own. Uh, but that these various trials are uh, a way to uh, prove, if you will, or, or test or refine the faith that we have as gold is tested by fire to get rid of all the the impurities and, and such it's not uh, um, it's not that these sufferings are things that you know god wants to kind of poke at us and, and and make sure that we really believe rather just as the gold is already there the gold is is there god has given us the gold it's just that um this these experiences that we we have of suffering um bring that gold into a, a greater purity, if you will, um, uh, until, until uh, uh, we come, um, as he says in verse 9, that the outcome of your faith, uh, you obtain the salvation of your souls. Um, so this, what we experience in, in the life of faith is, it's not purposeless, it's not meaningless, it has an end, uh, which is stored up for us in heaven. Um, it, yes, we're being tested in this life, but um, the outcome is, is guaranteed for us already um, through Jesus Christ. Um, and he has these interesting verses too in, in, in verse eight. Uh, without having seen him, that is without having seen Jesus, yet you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with the un utterable and exalted joy. Um, so yeah, even in the midst of these trials and of suffering, still there is rejoicing um, because of the greater reality in which we participate through Jesus Christ. Um, and so these, as we get to the second week now of after Easter, we're starting to see what the resurrection means uh, for the first Christians. Um, and for us uh, today, um, still 2,000 years later. So uh, any, other, any other thoughts about this reading from the first letter of Peter? Sometimes I get really impatient with the lectionary authors because I can't see the connection between the scriptures. But boy, in this one, this epistle really ties tightly to the gospel reading we're about to discuss because when he says to the believers that he's writing to that you have not seen him, um, but you love him, uh, he's saying exactly the reality that all of us have experienced, and that is that we believe in Jesus. We haven't seen him physically, but we've been brought to faith through his word and through his gospel. And um, that's exactly what he's going to say to John in the uh, not John, but to Thomas in the gospel reading, that blessed are they who have not seen, but still believe. We are the blessed. And they were the blessed that Peter was writing to. And so it's a wonderful, tight connection between these readings. Why I, I would guess that's one of the things that they were considering when they linked that one together with uh, the gospel readings for this Sunday. So kind of neat. The Holy Gospel according to John When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger on the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. All right. Well, it's, it's another account of um, Easter when Jesus arose. The disciples are all behind locked doors in John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. We heard John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18 last week. And um, Jesus comes to them and he says, You wretches, you terrible, lousy misfits. No, that's not what he said. (laughs) He doesn't come scolding them for all of their weaknesses of faith, for all their uh, denials of him for the running away in the Garden of Gethsemane. First words out of his mouth are gospel, shalom. And he probably said it in Hebrew or Aramaic. And uh, we have peace, Uh, peace to you. And he says it again before he's done. And then he says it again when he comes back a week later and Thomas is with him. And so there's a wonderful affirmation of Jesus' attitude and his love toward his disciples in that one word, that what he wants us to feel is wholeness that's what the word shalom means completeness and he has made us complete by his sacrifice on the cross by his resurrection we are now complete in the sight of god because of the imputed righteousness of christ and so um then he it comes to them and breathes on them and says and now you receive the holy spirit because you're going to have a job to do and you're going to need the holy spirit's power and then uh, uh, and pentecost uh, it's going to pour out, be poured out on them. Um, and he gives each one of the disciples what they need in order to believe in him. He says, touch me. Um, and so when Thomas says, I want to put my hands in the nail holes, I want to put my hand, um, my fingers in the nail holes and my hands in the side, he's not asking for anything that the other disciples hadn't needed. And for them to believe that this was not a ghost, that this is a risen. And I don't know why the church has called Thomas doubting Thomas, because all the disciples were doubters. They didn't believe the women when the women told them that Jesus was risen. And so, um, but what is important is not the disciples and their weakness of faith and, and that, but the power of Jesus' love that he's willing to say to both them and a week later to Thomas, I want to give you what you need. So you'll believe in me. And he does it. And he does it after you and me. Sometimes when we're down on our luck and we're just feeling lousy, he will give us a pick-me-up, um, a little miracle, a God moment, or something like that, that affirms our faith that, yes, he is alive. Yes, he's hearing my prayers. And he does that for his disciples, both on the first Easter day and then a week later when he appears to all of them and Thomas. Um, I got a couple other things, but I'm going to give you a chance to jump in. Go ahead. 
I, I think uh, it's it's remarkable that that Jesus's first words are "Peace be with you." You know, um, it's not God does not come back uh, from the dead as seeking vengeance. Um, you know, uh, or, or or spilling his wrath upon uh, those who who uh, put Jesus to death, uh, but rather it's it's a message of peace and forgiveness. Um, and reconciliation, new life, the new creation, um, and so, I, I as as Christians, that's that's who our uh, that's who we have our faith in is one who forgives, one who gives peace and, and new life. I think it's important in this text to notice what is not being said uh, when he says to Thomas on the second Sunday of Easter. Um, you have believed because you've seen. He doesn't say more blessed are those who have not seen but believe. He doesn't play that kind of a game with Thomas. He doesn't guilt him for needing that. He doesn't guilt the other disciples for needing a pick-me-up. Um, but he simply says, you're blessed by having seen me. Guess what? There are going to be millions of people who will never see me, but they will come to faith in me. Why? Because of your word, your testimony. And according to tradition, Thomas went to India, and that's where he did his missionary work. And today, when you go to India and talk to Christians there, they all remember that Thomas was the one who brought them the gospel. And so uh, each of the disciples had their story to tell, and God used it to bring them to faith. And um, so it's, it's just a wonderful reminder uh, that uh, Jesus is really all-powerful, and he can work through every obstacle. By the way, let me ask you a question. Where was Jesus um, when the doors were locked both weeks? And how did he get into the room? Good question. It's a trick question. Oh, okay. Because, the question, because he didn't come into the room. It says he came and stood among them, which is a way for the gospel writer to indicate that he is present. But he is now in a state of exaltation. He is no longer in a state of humiliation. Therefore, he has all the divine qualities of God, even though he's got a human body. That means he's omnipresent, present everywhere. So he was in that room when the disciples were scared, and he appears on first Easter. He's in that room when they are reporting to Thomas what they've seen, and he says, here's what I need to believe myself. And so when he appears to Thomas, he doesn't have to say, what do you need, Thomas? He just acts on what he has heard Thomas say. And that's why I believe that Thomas says, my Lord and my God, immediately. He recognizes that Jesus is true God and that Jesus has heard everything he said. And now Jesus has responded with love and with grace and acceptance. It's wonderful. Yeah. What's also wonderful, too, is that Jesus did that in front of all the rest of them. Yes. That everybody could, everybody were witnesses to the fact that Jesus forgave or encouraged or helped Thomas come to faith, and he didn't hold it against him. Um, and it wasn't some private religious experience. It was a public Jesus accepted him and his weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and in so doing, accepts all of ours as well. I think that's a good point, that Jesus often speaks to one person, expecting everybody in the crowd to eavesdrop. And mm -hmm. as he's talking to Thomas and saying to him, you have believed because you have seen, he's kind of letting the other disciples know, yeah, that's you too, guys. So don't play one-upsmanship on Thomas here, okay? Mm -hmm. But then he's also reminding all the other disciples as well as Thomas, and you've got the job to do because there are going to be a lot of people who are going to come to believe in me, even though they haven't seen, because of your word, because of your report. And after Pentecost, they'll be inspired to write the scriptures that we use to do that. So that's a, a, a wonderful tactic, teaching tactic that Jesus often uses to get eavesdroppers to benefit. And that's what we are. We're eavesdroppers on them these conversations so anything else well we want to thank you all for joining us on this second sunday in easter and we 
if you like these um, conversations, will you please like and maybe subscribe and then you'll get an automatic uh, notice when they're available and um, mention them to your friends. And thank you for joining us and please continue to practice social distancing, continue to be vigilant and smart and do the things that you need to do to protect not just yourself, but to protect anyone you might come in contact with. Um, so thank you for joining us and see you guys later. Mm -hmm. See ya. See ya.